Millions of Americans are fleeing left-wing hellholes. Will the last one turn out the lights? The new year is a wonderful time to consider life changes. For millions of Americans, that means fleeing their socialist dystopia for the warm embrace of those very red states the elite despises. A few days ago, my colleague E.J. Antoni wrote a front-page article in the New York Post on fresh census data how millions of Americans are fleeing blue states most dramatically New York, for the relative small government utopias of Florida and Texas. In raw numbers in the year to July, 217,000 people fled New York. It's about 1.1% of the population, which is a typical wartime number. Where did they all go? Florida and Texas each added roughly 400,000 new residents over the period. California, Illinois, and Massachusetts are all seeing similar flights. So why are they fleeing? Two reasons, taxes and dysfunctional public services. In fact, in a study two years ago, EJ had predicted this after the Empire State hiked income taxes to a top rate of 15%. So that comes to 60% when you add on the federal take. Toss in the poop-strewn urban hellscapes of modern LA or New York. As one retired NYPD officer put it, quote, criminals and migrants are being put ahead of everyday New Yorkers. People are getting sick of it and young families no longer see this as a place to raise their children. The bitter irony is taxes and crappy services are actually linked. The more tax you pay, the worse the services get, because taxes spawn an entire parasitic activist class who grabs the pothole money for their diversity initiatives. To give a flavor, California taxes over $9,000 per person, and New York State over $10,000, Yet they can't fix the potholes or hire enough police to keep junkies from bashing tourists in the head with bricks. Meanwhile, Florida and Texas take 4000 per person, so less than half, and somehow manage to have better roads and precisely zero junkies hitting tourists with bricks. Of course, this all suggests there's a really easy solution. Slash the taxes. Starve the beast, as Ronald Reagan put it. Force cities and states to defund the activist empire, and whittled down to the roads, sanitation, and public safety that was the original deal. So what's next? Brought to you by Unchained. In theory, eventually it gets bad enough that voters rebel and then politicians fix things. Alas, there's something called the Curly Effect, named after a Boston mayor who looted the city in vote-buying schemes. Gambling, his opponents would simply move out. It worked, and Mayor Curly got just the voters he wanted at the end of it. Indeed, we have a perfect case study in Detroit, celebrated as the high-tech city of the future in the 1950s. Then, as it deteriorated in the 60s, the middle class fled of all races. In other words, the frog did not jump to vote. The frog jumped to a whole nother pond. Having said, maybe this time is different because of the internet. After all, in the 50s and 60s, media was a left-wing cartel, and it was hard to even know what was happening. Whereas today, even with the censorship, we're able to get information out and organize via social media. The COVID censorship proved that. It's not perfect, but compared to the 50s or 60s, when there was nothing, I'll take what we have today. Add in St. Elon and even dare we dream a quorum of Republicans who find their testicles, and maybe voters can actually organize before it's too late. Okay, we'll be watching. See you next time.